Good evening. Welcome to the May or the September 23rd, 2021 uh, Bloomington Planning Commission meeting. Tonight we have four items on our agenda. Uh, one of those uh, open for public hearing. A um, couple things here for you before we start. The Planning Commission is made up of seven members, uh, volunteers from the community. They are appointed by the City Council and serve for up to three year terms. The Planning Commission does provide recommendations to the City Council and has some final decisions. Um, and tonight, uh, we have, again, one item that will be recommended uh, for City Council at the October 25th uh, for public hearing. And with that, before we start tonight, uh, if I could have everybody uh, stand and we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, before we get started tonight, Mr. Markegaard, would you go through uh, some of the changes again we have for testimony tonight? Sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, tonight we're in person and uh, we have one public hearing. People can definitely testify here at the podium in person uh, if you're watching remotely. Uh, you can also testify remotely via phone. And what you would do is call the number on the screen. It's 1-415-655-0001. Uh, and once in, you would enter in the access code, again on the screen, 2454-561-0217. And we'll have this number scrolling across the screen tonight, and uh, we'll bring it up uh, later during the public hearing as well. All right, thank you, Mr. Markegaard, appreciate that. And again, for the public tonight, um, after we hear the initial staff report, uh, the commission may ask the staff if they're for any questions, clarifying questions. Then we'll go to the applicant if they have any additional, which again is City of Bloomington tonight, and then we'll open up the public hearing. At that time, what we would ask is that people abide by a three minute limit uh, so that if there are others that wish to speak, they have an opportunity. And if there's more to be said, uh, we'll come back to that person um, after everybody's had an opportunity. So with that, uh, can we start with item number one, Mr. Johnson, fire station number four. Thanks, Chairman Solberg, members of the Planning Commission. Good to see you all. Get this set up here. Okay, maybe we should start at the start of the presentation instead of the end. <laughs> All right, uh, the two requests before you this evening, the formal aspects of the application involve a rezoning request uh, to add the, the PD uh, overlay district, the plan development overlay district, and then the preliminary and final development plans uh, for a new fire station four, replacing the existing station. <clears throat> so fire station four is located uh, to the west of France on 84th Street right at the intersection of Irwin Road, 84th, and uh, Johnson Avenue. Um, so you can see the surrounding uh, area here on this uh, location map. Wanda Miller Park is just across the street. Uh, there is a uh, office and technology use across Irwin Road. And then the remainder of the surrounding properties are uh, single family residential in nature. So that gives you a flavor of the, the neighborhood. Um, here is a zoomed in oblique image of the existing property. Uh, so you can see that the uh, site plan of the existing uh, fire station has a similar uh, circulation and driveway uh, pattern as what is going to be proposed before you in the, the site plan that I'll show you. Um, what you will notice is that this station is uh, much smaller. Uh, it is a one-story structure. Here's a street view uh, image of the existing station. Uh, so you can see that it uh, has much less storage capacity and uh, um, uh, ability to ho uh, house uh, the larger fire apparatus that serves this area. So that's just a street view of the existing station. So just by way of background, we talked about some of this stuff at the recent fire station ordinance uh, that came through your body in the city council. Um, but uh, by way of background, the majority of the city's fire stations were constructed in the 1960s and 70s. 
So those facilities have reached uh, the end of their useful life, life and uh, no longer are adequate uh, in terms of providing my modern fire protection uh, for Bloomington. And so as part of a uh, longer program to do, to do facility replacement over a period of time, uh, the city engaged in uh, some formal, some certainly a lot of informal work, but also a formal study of all of the city's fire stations. And that, that work was done beginning in 2018, but the bulk of it took place in 19 uh, and wrapped up in 20. And uh, one of the key components of that uh, fire station analysis work was not only kind of identifying the types of facilities that the city needed, but the locations. And uh, what that analysis yielded is that uh, the majority or uh, all the stations are located approximately in the correct place in order to serve uh, the neighborhoods that they serve. And that certainly is applicable to fire station uh, four here this evening. Um, and so that was, uh, and that's based on response time, that's based on different metrics uh, that, that fire departments use to uh, evaluate where to house their station areas based on response. So many of, some of you are on the board for Fire Station 3. Uh, when that came through, um, that was the first fire station uh, to be completed in this uh, facility replacement program. Um, and uh, that was a little bit of a unique circumstance in that the city was able to acquire uh, new lands to build that station. The majority of the other fire stations uh, are scheduled to be replaced on site, uh, the location of their existing facility. And uh, Fire Station 4, is the next facility uh, scheduled for replacement. So that's uh, the application before you this evening. Um, the rezoning action is really more of a formality or a small piece of what uh, is under your consideration tonight. The, the addition of the plan development overlay district simply is tied to their submission of preliminary and final development plans. The base zoning of the property is not set to change. So no underlying uh, you know, additional uses um, are allowed by not uh, by leaving the, the base zoning in place. So as you can see on the slide, it's simply just uh, throwing that hashing on the uh, fire station site, which represents the plan development overlay district. Getting to the site plan that's before you in the final development plans. Uh, as I said, the, the driveway access is proposed to remain the, ch remain the same. There's two driveways uh, to Irwin Road and a, a larger expanded driveway to West 84th Street. You can see the facility is in the central uh, portion of the site. It does extend further west than the existing condition. And of course, this is a two-story facility, so that's a significant change. Um, but this, this fire station has three uh, larger drive-through apparatus bays. It does have a fourth bay, uh, which I believe is scheduled for EMS uh, service that uh, tends to or often does park in this area. Um, the, the site takes advantage of uh, one-way uh, drive aisles and angled parking. It's kind of an efficiency uh, that they're doing, given the constrained nature of the site. That's uh, one way to kind of shave down uh, some of the required widths and, di and dimensions. Um, so that angled parking uh, is provided along the north as well as on the east side of the building. Um, other aspects that uh, kind of speak out, the, the existing site has some grade that starts on the high side on the west side of the site and uh, goes down to the east. So there are some retaining walls uh, being shown on the west to, to address that grade. And they actually kind of build out or dig out uh, the western portion of the building. So to, to the west, you actually won't be at the ground level uh, of the fire station if you were looking at it from the, the western uh, abutting properties. Um, yeah, that's kind of the key features of the site plan. They, they are showing... Uh, replacement sidewalk along West 84th Street, which certainly is um, part of our standard code requirements uh, for our collector road. And um, no sidewalk proposed along Irwin. Right now there is no uh, public sidewalk to connect to along Irwin. For uh, non-residential uses, it is allowed uh, to forgo the construction of sidewalks when it doesn't create a connection to the public network. Certainly if there ever was a sidewalk on Irwin, uh, the city would be um, uh, certainly interested in uh, completing that sideways, that sidewalk segment. So um, it's not there today, so not building it today. Um, the east, I should just mention the, the main public entrance, uh, or I should say entrance of the, the fire station is on the east side of the building, uh, served with a sidewalk connection to 84th Street. Here's a rendering of the proposed fire station. Uh, we'll talk about the building materials here in a minute, but uh, fairly uh, similar to a program of materials that was considered for Fire Station 3. Um, some similar, uh, you know, palette colors and uh, those types of things. So this is looking from the, it's lo from the northeast looking southwest, uh, if that makes sense, kind of standing in the middle of that street intersection. 
the materials are brick, stone, glass, and a limited amount of metal panel. Um, so certainly uh, strong and good primary building materials that we'd like to see. The code, as far as just non-residential buildings in this district, just has a restriction on coatings, and certainly none of these materials would, uh, would need or benefit from coatings. So that's not an issue. Um, let's get rid of that. Um, the other uh, element I'll mention here just when we're looking at the building elevations is that uh, one, one of the things that might be of question or uh, consideration of the Planning Commission is structure height. The tallest portion of the structure is 44.7 feet in height, and that's to the, so to the southern, uh, uh, the southern build building elevation, um, and that's where they do some of their aerial training and other things. But given this is a residential area, uh, just to note that city code maximum is 40 feet, so they are exceeding that by 4 feet in height and requesting flexibility for that. But just to note that that's where you would see that larger structure height is on the south side. And then uh, on this west elevation, this is uh, that area where you have that retaining wall. And so you can see how this, the, the uh, station is uh, kind of dug out and that uh, the abutting property to the west is actually a bit higher. So the, the massing of the building uh, and the extent of how tall it feels or seems will be lessened uh, via that. Here's the floor plan on the uh, ground level. So this is uh, you know day-to-day -day operations and certainly equipment focused. You have the offices and the dispatch on the east and north sides of the building. You do have some classroom space in the southeast portion of the building for training and uh, other educational purposes for the firefighters. Um, in the central portion of the building, you have uh, decontamination facilities so as they take uh, their equipment out on uh, runs or calls. They have to uh, treat it when they get back. Uh, the hose tower and the stairwell serving the uh, facilities on the south side. That gets to that structure height that we talked about. And then in the central and west and north portion of the building, that's the apparatus bays where they would be uh, housing the larger fire trucks. On the west side of the structure, it is the uh, trash and recycling storage area, as well as an enclosure uh, planned for a uh, generator, which serves as backup power uh, in the case of an emergency, uh, which is needed for a public safety facility. The second level of the fire station, uh, this is more of uh, some of the dormitory and other uh, supportive services type uses uh, for the firefighters. So. Uh, dormitories for certainly health and wellness, and as they're uh, um, required to do longer shifts for the firefighters, they can rest in the dormitory facilities. There's eight of those rooms, and then they have other associated spaces, fitness and uh, kitchen, um, as, they, uh, as they go through their shifts. And then there is also a training space on the second level as well. Um, the apparatus bays are certainly just open uh, to the floor below, so the, really the use aspect is more on the east side of the side of the second level. And then you have the stairwell and the, the hose tower. In terms of the landscaping plan that's proposed, they are proposing a code compliant amount of materials. Um, uh, a lot of a significant amount of shrubs associated with the uh, project. Um, uh, we would like to see them locate some additional trees on the north side of the site if possible. I know that they're uh, concerned about conflicts with uh, uh, ladder trucks and other apparatus that is taller and that makes sense. Um, so we'll uh, try and elbow them in the ribs to look at that, but uh, um, that's something that we would uh, recommend. Um, otherwise, the landscape plan, uh, for the most part, is compliant, so no issues there. Uh, getting to the PD flexibility uh, being proposed in this application, um, just keeping in mind that, uh, that a plan development does allow for the request of flexibility, uh, if you meet certain criteria, one, you have to be consistent with the intent of the PD ordinance, uh, which has to do with enhanced design and other things. Uh, but the most important element or the test, if you will, uh, related to as you evaluate PD flexibility has to do with uh, meeting a public benefits test, uh, a fire station, given that it's a public safety facility that provides essential service to the community is going to have a fairly uh, straightforward or easy path to demonstrating that public benefit. Um, if there's questions about individual ones, we can certainly talk about them. But uh, on the slide before you is the uh, menu or extent of PD flexibility that is included. Uh, the majority of these flexibilities are modest uh, in nature and scale, uh, but all of them really are tied to uh, the constrained nature of the site of constructing a modern facility on the existing site without uh, you know, doing acquisitions or adding additional land area. 
Um, the site is an acre in size, so certainly building a modern fire station on that uh, facility is going to uh, be challenging from a full code compliance perspective. So getting to the structure setbacks, that is one I will talk about. I'll just talk about the, the ground sign, um, unless there's other questions about others. But the structure setbacks, uh, the main uh, flexibility being requested, as I said, they're, they're fairly modest. And the reason I say that is that uh, that uh, enclosure for the generator and the trash and recycling area, which is enclosed, not the generator area, but the uh, trash and recycling area, you know, that's a fairly uh, limited in height. It's around six feet in height. Um, and that area is seven feet away from the property line, so that doesn't meet the 20-foot required setback. But that's a fairly small uh, structure. Uh, the portion of the building that's not meeting, uh, and it gets a little bit confusing because sometimes setback is based on structure height versus um, it's either the greater of the structure height or just 20 feet. So you can see that small uh, or that narrow red outline portion of the building, that's not meeting a required 24-foot setback, but it's fairly close. That's a small uh, dimension. And then uh, on the northeast portion of the building and just uh, near the garage uh, bay doors, um, there's a 50-foot setback to West 84th Street, which uh, currently as being shown is 46th Street, uh, 46 feet, not street, excuse me. So again, fairly modest uh, in the size of the, the flexibility being requested. Um, the other PD flexibility that is involved in this, we can talk about these individually if people have questions, um, but uh, the staff report did outline these uh, various requests for flexibility. They include structure height, parking drive aisle setbacks, landscape yards, those two are kind of connected. Um, the parking quantity, uh, similar to other projects, we used an internal capture approach, but just a, um, kind of from a procedural standpoint, did identify that as flexibility even though they uh, kind of have uses that operate concurrently. Um, retaining wall setbacks, similar to uh, a multifamily project that we brought for through uh, a little ways back. You know, one of the reasons why retaining walls have setbacks is that you don't have large massing along building lines. In this case, the wall is beneath the, the higher property to the west. So it really doesn't present any uh, um, kind of impact or nuisance that way. And then uh, retaining walls and parking lot uh, screening, yeah, we support those things. The one thing I'll mention, uh, the, the one uh, flexibility uh, that planning staff is not in uh, concurrence with with the applicants has to do with the ground sign setback. Um, and the reason for that, it's not uh, overly complex or uh, in any way um, uh, mean-spirited in any way. Really what it's about is that uh, a code-compliant setback for the sign could be provided uh, in that area. They believe that uh, having it closer to the street would be beneficial uh, to promote public safety messages, and we certainly respect that uh, desire and that uh, perspective. Uh, but in terms of looking at flexibility, uh, you know, planning staff and uh, staff in general can be can take a uh, more analytical or rigid approach when it comes to seeking deviation or flexibility only when it's necessary versus uh, desired. So the ability to provide that facility at a complying setback is what's uh, part of that uh, recommendation. So that's the PD flexibility that's offered as part of this package. Um, miscellaneous issues that come up, you know, similar to any project will include conditions that they have to meet, uh, provide a lighting plan to be approved. They comply with their trash recycling standards, fencing on site complies, um, that rooftop screening is, is provided in order for uh, visual impact purposes. One thing I do want to touch on is that, you know, with an outdoor generator, um, they're not proposing to have that enclosed at this time. Uh, we've let the fire department and the applicant know about the city's noise requirements. This has been an issue that has uh, generated some interest in the past, certainly. Um, so the city has, uh, they're called L10 noise standards in terms of sustained decibel level of noise that those facilities create. Uh, they have a couple things going for them. One, they don't operate this generator very often, uh, typically just quarterly or monthly to test it. Um, power outages to the station are uh, infrequent, or uh, maybe the chief could tell me how often they occur, but not often. Um, the other thing is that that area is sunken into that hill. Uh, so in terms of uh, noise waves or uh, the reverberation or the, the nuisance it creates, so that mitigates that a little bit. In addition to that, um, they are proposing, I believe, some uh, noise uh, in or some encasement of the equipment, not a not an enclosed structure per se, uh, but some a, a generator type that does mitigate some of the noise that it creates. So, between those issues, uh, 
you know, I don't believe it will create a nuisance. It's something they have to continue to monitor, uh, but we've uh, let them know about the, the ordinance requirement. And I should state that the Environmental Health Department is currently working on changing the city's noise standards uh, to be consistent with state statute. I know at, at a previous application, there were some inconsistencies between our code and the state law. So I don't know if that'll come through Planning Commission. I would anticipate it probably wouldn't, but that's something that Environmental Health is currently working on. So just a heads up on that. But um, other than that, you know, public testimony or uh, public correspondence received. We did get one email with some questions. Hopefully, you saw that. Um, there were some questions about stormwater management and uh, you know thoughts on the sign and some other things. Um, as far as stormwater goes, just for the neighbors are concerned, there is uh, some uh, drainage that does occur along the western property line as flowed south, is my understanding. With them carving out that hill and then providing new stormwater management facilities on site, they should actually be receiving less stormwater. Uh, in the proposed condition than the existing condition. So that should be a benefit uh, to the neighbors. So um, that was the main uh, point I wanted to touch on in the correspondence. Um, there, the call-in number is on the screen. Should anyone need to reference that again, and I can bring that back up. But other than that, staff is recommending approval with two motions. So I'll stand for questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any questions for Mr. Johnson from the commission members? Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson, for the update on this project. I have a couple of questions, if I may. Um, the first one is around um, just for the, the context setting of planned development. In my time on this body, I'm not aware of a time when we have, uh, maybe we have, and I just don't recall, had a planned development for, I mean, this isn't really a planned development. It's one lot, one project. It's not a future long-term plan. So can you talk about um, that part of our code and how this this uh, fits the concept of a plan development versus approaching this as a plan development to be able to loosen the the bounds. Yeah, uh, Chairman Solberg, Commissioner Roman, um, that's fair. Not all plan developments that we deal with are multi-phase projects. Actually, many of them are a single phase. Um, so, I mean, in, in the case of uh, why to pursue a plan development. The plan development does have built-in uh, flexibility should you be able to meet certain criteria. So it is a tool uh, to kind of provide some innovation or, to, you know, one way to address difficult sites, typically for the development community, not the city as a developer, obviously. Um, but uh, it's not uncommon to have single-phase uh, development. I, Glenn might have a better idea if any other city facilities have ever uh, utilized the plan development uh, tool as a means of development. I, I, uh, that doesn't, uh, I don't recall that offhand. Um, but uh, I mean, it's not unique to Bloomington. The plan development tool is basically a means to get flexibility from the zoning code if you are able to provide uh, in our code a public benefit. But that's kind of a common approach amongst other cities as well. Okay. Um, and I'm thinking about this project in relation to Station 3, which we saw, I guess it's probably been two-ish years or so mm -hmm. ago now. Um, you know, very similar design, very similar approach. Um, one of the things that was in the staff report was re requirements on exterior lighting, uh, timers, motion sensors, et cetera, et cetera, things that were tied to alarms. Uh, what kind of standards are there for interior lighting, given that there are significant amounts of windows with the, the four panel doors, especially mm -hmm. uh, those that face the south. And I, I mean, you see station three and it's a, it's a beacon. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, and that that's something that, uh, I, to, to be frank, that's not something that I uh, zeroed in or, or concentrated on greatly. I don't think, we don't have, uh, the building code itself has certainly standards for internal lighting. Um, so that's something that's always worked out with their electrical permit and uh, the electrical reviewers who review those plans. Uh, the only thing that comes to mind, and I know that we've done, is we've had some self-storage facilities right. in the past um, that we have mm -hmm. uh, that we have uh, put some extra conditions on in terms of keeping those uh, not illuminated. Um, I'll certainly let the fire chief speak to it, but my guess is that um, uh, in the the event of you know those facilities aren't providing a public safety purpose, so in the event of an emergency. Uh, I'm sure that they would uh, uh, need lighting. I think the key you're trying to make is don't overlight it, right? Unnecessarily, well, yes, of course, or or lighting at uh, different times. Sure. Um, and then my last question regarding uh, this topic right for now is: um, at Station Three, did that, my, to the best of my knowledge, that project did not include a LED sign, monument sign, correct? 
Yeah, uh, Commissioner uh, Roman, sorry, Chair Solberg. They they had one planned. They never uh, have installed it to to this date. I think they still hope to. Sure. Um, but that's something with just all the there, there was a lot of changes happening along East Old Chocopee Road at that time, uh, and so they were uh, kind of putting pause on that until they waited till they see how to orient the sign with the new uh, changes that Hennepin County made to that roadway. And if I recall, most of the surrounding uses at that site were not residential, correct? Uh, some of them are. Um, to the west, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. I think especially particularly on the south side of the roadway, um, there are some right. residential uses. But, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other commissioners? Commissioner Cookton? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Johnson, going back to the uh, plan development again, I noticed in your graphic a lot of the parcels directly to the south of this one have a PD overlay. Do we know why that is? Yeah, Commissioner Cook, uh, Chairman Solberg, Commissioner Cook, done. I uh, forgive my bad uh, job at formalities here. Um, yes, I did do a little bit of research on that. It is kind of odd uh, that you see a bunch of single-family properties, and I'm sure homeowners have, uh, you know, no idea that many of their properties have the plan development overlay. The reason what it has to do with is that that uh, west side of Irwin Road was actually not platted and subdivided uh, until as part of that condo or apartment uh, building project that would happen to the southeast of them. Um, my guess is that it had a, a similar landowner and came under uh, an original uh, plan development, PD, uh, preliminary development plan. Uh, and then they pursued subdivision of that land as to single family homes. But for whatever, because it came in under the same PD, that overlay extends over those parcels. So that's the reason for that. Thanks. Yeah. But as far as I know, all those lots meet our minimum R1 requirements. So that there's no flexibility that was uh, granted for those lots. It just happened to be the development they came in under. Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Johnson, I forgot my other question uh, uh, related to the sign question. What is our, uh, for the benefit of those here, what is our sign um, standard or sign uh, permitted? What kind of signs are permitted in R1? Yeah, good question. Uh, thanks, Commissioner Roman. You can have uh, uh, ground signs. You can have electronic signs, actually, at many uh, places of assembly uh, around town, actually, uh, deploy them and utilize them to show what time their services are and things like that. So they're not uncommon um, in residential areas. We do have standards for how bright they can be. Um, those screens tend to get fairly bright. And so uh, what we do, and actually signs all over the community, we'll go out and we'll inspect them. Uh, for their brightness level to ensure that they don't become, uh, you know, too, for lack of a better term, too obnoxious. Um, and the standard is lower in a residential area than it is, say, if you were on Lindale or if you were along uh, 494 or 35W. So we do have standards for that, and we do inspect. Thanks. Yeah. Mr. Johnson, just uh, as long as we're on the sign discussion, um, I don't know if you have the, the site plan that you can go back to again. Can you show me where that uh, where the proposed sign is and where um, you you say it would meet standards? Yeah, here's the sign right here. Okay, it's in that northeast. Excuse me, it's in that northeast corner. Uh, currently, it's shown at a five foot setback, uh, and it meets the setback requirement to Irwin Road to the east. It just doesn't happen to meet it to 84th, where it's at a five foot. Um, it's at uh, 15 feet is the code requirement. Um, there's a flagpole that's planned just to the south. Of that area, I can't zoom in because the PowerPoint slide, but um, sure. uh, I could bring up my uh, blue beam. But um, so they, what it, basically what it would be as a as a design choice. I mean, you could locate the fire the flagpole theoretically somewhere else too. And these are conversations we have with the designers uh, as the course of going through reviewing the project. Uh, but effectively, what it would be, uh, the simple solution would be to swap the flagpole and the sign. Uh, as you move the sign further away from the street, obviously uh, it makes it a little bit. Uh, less visible, um, but part part of the part of the reason we have signage regulations to begin with is to not overly clutter uh, the public right of way. Um, so not that this is a, a busy right of way; this is a residential area as opposed to a commercial area. But just thinking through why those uh, standards exist in the first place, the sign still would be visible at a 15 foot setback. But I can understand the desire to um, to, to push it forward. So how far would that be off the travel lane again? Would you be able to? Uh, I, uh, I'd have to pull up blue beam. I'm, that, to me, looks like about a 10-foot uh, or maybe a 12-foot boulevard. So if it's 5 feet off the line, then it would be a little under 20 feet about from the travel feet. lane versus uh, 30 feet uh, difference. So you're talking about a 10-foot difference. Okay. 20 and feet to 30 feet precisely. 
Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, next question, just um, and, and uh, understanding the uh, as we talk about the retaining wall setbacks, just it, for clarification's sake, um, I'm assuming that's a stacked block wall and doesn't have tiebacks, or do is that an issue in this particular instance? Do we know at this point? Yeah, so we, we have uh, assessed that and evaluated that with other projects. We haven't gotten to that level of the uh, nitty-gritty design, but they do uh, have engineered modular block type walls that do not require tiebacks. Um, given that you know this is a more modest wall uh, in height, I don't think that it will need significant tiebacks. Um, the designers are here. They probably could give okay. me uh, give you a precise answer as opposed to a half uh, a half answer. But um, <laughs> uh, well, and I think that uh, we'll we'll leave that for the applicants because I yeah. think that's as much goes back to the uh, uh, request in in that setback. And then uh, we talk about the uh, um, height uh, restrictions and just to I want to be clear. I understand. The the ch the uh, variance in that is really for the hose tower. Is that correct? It's not for the entire uh, second floor. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Solberg. I'm gonna um, circle this area here where it's located. It's actually not the hose tower. It's the stair tower. Oh, okay. Um, so it's this portion of the stair tower, the very uh, tip top. If you see the block, the stone uh, stairwell. Um, as opposed to the brick on the left hand side of the mm -hmm. south elevation shot. Um, so there's a there's a full door access that gets allows the firefighters to get up on the roof uh, to do aerial training, and that's on the actual north side of the the stairwell. But in order to achieve that full door height and to have a stairwell up to the roof as opposed to a ladder, um, uh, that's why they need that height of the 44 uh, feet to, to for the required clearance. So they do aerial training up here. I mean, and it also serves as uh, certainly as a uh, maintenance. Uh, um, purpose as well for the equipment on the roof. Um, they have some mechanical units and other things. So, and that's a deviation of uh, approximately four and a half feet. Four and a half feet. That's right. Okay. And then I'm gonna maybe ask you on the site plan because it, it, when I was trying to look through it, it was hard to tell maybe some of these distances. But how far is that uh, stairwell unit um, from the west property line and the south property line, just for uh, impact purposes? Yeah, Chairman Solberg, it's closer to the south property line. If I had to guess, it's probably um, anywhere between 25 and 30 feet. Well, no, it's further than that. Uh, uh, maybe 35 to 35 ish feet, because you got a five foot. Uh, you have a five foot landscape yard. You have at least a minimum a 20 foot drive aisle and another five feet. So my guess is it's about 35 feet from the the south property line. From the west line, it is a significant distance. Um, I could pull up our. Uh, PDF reader and actually take some measurements if you like, but um. uh, if you can at some point. And then just my last final question, um, I just forgot. So, uh, commissioners, any other questions? Commissioner Cookton. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Johnson, did you want to wrap this one up first, or uh, I can do two. I can chew gum and uh, walk. <laughs> oh, and perfect. What a skilled staff we have here. Uh, just going back to the sign setback again, um, the, the, the intent of that, and I think you maybe already answered this, but the intent of the sign setback, is that more of a nuisance thing or is it a traffic safety thing where you don't want, if a car leaves the road, you don't want them hitting that thing? Uh, it's 100 feet, Chairman Solberg. Thank you. To the west line. Um, I mean, I'd say it's a combination of things. I mean, we're not often processing signage for uh, fire stations or for city hall or for whatever. So you could argue that these regulations are uh, drafted and intended for more commercial purpose. And I wouldn't disagree with you there. Um, uh, the point we would make is that certainly we want to hold ourselves accountable to the same regulations that we uh, impose upon the private market. Uh, but in addition to that, when we look at reasons to use flexibility, when there's a code complying alternative, that's when we're more hesitant uh, to, to look to that tool. So that's that's just what informs staff's perspective on that. As I said, there's no uh, mean spirit or, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, is, is uh, informing our perspective. It just has to do with uh, kind of what our profession demands, to be honest. Sure. And yeah. what I'm really interested in there is the safety component of that. And if I have any fellow planning commissioners that have expertise on traffic safety and have any insight on that, they're welcome to uh, <laughs> let me know that later. Um, I do have one other question. Um, can you go back to your list of uh, PD deviations they're looking for? 
absolutely. There you are. One thing I don't think I saw here was pervious surface that I thought I recalled seeing in the staff report. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so the, uh, the previous action that the Planning Commission and City Council uh, went, uh, went to work on, um, I think it wrapped up in August, but maybe at Planning Commission on July 22nd, I believe. Um, but basically what uh, the, the PD uh, ordinance, the Plan Development Ordinance, has limitations on certain aspects of what types of flexibility you can request which was more relevant or pertinent to this discussion tonight actually had to do with floor area ratio. There were some limitations for institutional uses that would have limited the size of this building uh, based on the amount of land area that can have. I'm, I think you guys are familiar with FAR and, and what, uh, um, what that entails. But another thing that uh, the city did in, a, in addition to that FAR uh, change was that fire stations are exempt from maximum impervious surface requirements for non-residential uses in the R1. Currently, the standard is 75% maximum hardcover. This site plan before you this evening, I believe, checks in at right around 84%. Uh, percent. So it's not, a, it's not a formal request for flexibility because the facility is now uh, exempt as a result of that city code amendment that was processed earlier this summer. Thank you. All right, Mr. Johnson, one more question, and that uh, just has to do the existing site has fencing, I believe, on the west and south side. Um, you, you mentioned something about fencing remaining in, in uh, potential on site uh, with all the major construction. I just want to verify that uh, in addition to the, the landscaping and everything, our, is the uh, proposal to include um, some sort of screening like that on the south and west side? The, yeah, thanks, Chairman uh, Solberg. They are proposing that. I haven't seen the detail on what type of fencing. I assume it's a similar six-foot uh, privacy fence, uh, fully opaque. Um, but uh, there's, I haven't seen the full architectural uh, set, and that's that detail I think is probably located in there. The architect might have an idea of what type of fence they're looking at. But I would assume it's very similar to what's out there today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any further questions for staff? All right. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, applicant, uh, architect, if you'd like to uh, speak to this. Good, good evening. Good uh, evening. Uh, commissioners, uh, uh, my name is Quinn Hudson. I'm with a principal with CNH Architects. And uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, cover a couple of the things that came up that I maybe have some fuller answers on and uh, cover that and then certainly open to any other questions you have. Um, interior lighting, I'm just taking the order that I wrote them down, but interior lighting, um, actually, yeah, we were very concerned and, and focused on sustainability. And uh, so the design will include uh, vacancy and occupancy sensor combinations so that lighting inside uh, you know, would be uh, self-turning uh, off when not in use. And we're also using relatively low um, uh, lighting levels, particularly in office and, and residential areas. Uh, the apparatus bays themselves, we want to make sure as a public safety functional use space, we want to keep that safe for the firefighters. So it's not overwhelming, but it's, it's not, you know, it's kind of just average uh, light levels in there. But they, all, they too will uh, function with uh, vacancy sensors. Okay. Um, secondly, in order, the, uh, I'll give some of our thoughts on the monument sign and, uh, yeah, and uh, maybe uh, the chief can cover uh, other items as well. But uh, one of the things that we were looking at, uh, uh, because of the limited uh, green space that we have, uh, particularly up along the uh, you know, 84th and the, and the corner of Roman, that we wanted to plant the green space that we do have uh, relatively full to, to provide additional screening uh, for parking to the extent we could. The further back that we pull the monument sign from Irwin, excuse me, from 84th Street, uh, requires any plantings there to be uh, lower uh, and of smaller nature so that it does not block the sign, um, you know, defeating the purpose all the, you know, of, the, of having the public uh, announcement capability. So our intent of having it further forward allows the uh, landscaping behind it to be of a, a larger nature. Uh, so in addition to uh, the uh, fire department's goals of, of uh, public safety announcements, uh, uh, visibility as well. But that, that was from a design sense, uh, one of the things we were looking at. 
Retaining wall um, does not require tiebacks. We're using uh, the very large format retaining wall block systems that can go uh, easily to this height without uh, additional tieback. Um, and then fence type, uh, we are looking at a six foot high solid fence, uh, low maintenance uh, type approach. We haven't picked a specific brand, but that's the type of thing we're looking at. I think that covers all the things that were out there. Certainly any other questions I'd, I'd be happy to entertain. Sure. Commissioners, any questions for the architect or Mr. Hudson? Commissioner Cookton? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Hudson, I asked a question about pervious surface, and being that uh, we don't have a requirement for it, I'm sure you did not look at this, but my question is, did, did you or was there any consideration of pervious concrete to lessen the impervious surface area? Um, there was there's particularly there wasn't particularly uh, an approach that was looking at that. Uh, it particularly would not have been uh, appropriate for the heavy loads of the apparatus bay, apparatus traffic areas, uh, and then the areas in which where we have the uh, asphalt is where we actually have the infiltration basins under underground. So I, I I'm we are having significant infiltration with uh, with that um, meeting requirements. So uh, it. it I guess I, we looked at we were more addressing it in that sense. Thank you. All right. Uh, any further questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Appreciate that. I don't know, uh, Chief, if you want, have anything else to add or? Unless you have more questions for me, I think we answered everything that you asked. I think uh, maybe just the one question, and, and uh, Commissioner Roman asked about it, the sign over on uh, Station 3 versus Station 4, uh, what's – can you maybe explain a little bit more about the intent to that? Uh, help us understand uh, some of that since it's not being used on three yet and it's being proposed here for four. Well, the the sign at three was delayed because of the improvements on Old Shakopee Road that was undertaken by county at the same time we were building the station. And there was so much variation in what was going on there. It was just wasn't wasn't uh, we weren't able to come up with a, a a solid plan to place it there because of what county was doing and the things that were going on along east 86th as well and there was some relocation of power lines and some utilities so there was a lot going on there so uh you know we plan to revisit and revisit in it in the future we just haven't gotten to it yet okay. go ahead uh, commissioner albrecht thank you mr chair uh in uh, a public correspondence note, there is some questions about who will use both the dormitory and fitness facilities. Can you speak to that just briefly? Is it just the folks who are working or volunteering within the area? Or is that open generally to other people? No, it's just, it will be just, that facility will be just used by firefighters. Okay. Keep going. Mr. Chair. Uh, and then same for the gym or fitness facility as well. That is well. correct. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Chair, I have a oh. another question. Oh, Excuse me. sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Cookton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Chief Seal, a uh, question about the sign again. What is – can you just give me a flavor of what would be on that sign? I heard public safety messages. Can you help me understand a little better of what that means? So um, I'm sure, like – this time of year, every year, we're coming up on Fire Prevention Week and Fire Prevention Month for October, and we put messages out um, routinely, um, um, trying to get fire safety messages out. We'll also do the same thing during school programs in um, the uh, uh, late winter and the February March time frame when we're out doing uh, school programs. So we try to um, keep um, um, fire messaging kind of up in front in people's uh, minds. Um, so like for, for instance, this year with the drought conditions we had and, and, and open burning and, and, and fire situation. So we uh, um, are fortunate in that our customer base never leaves us without a need to um, try to further their education about fire use and fire safety. So we uh, that's the purpose of it. It's more than just a one week a year. We'd like to jog people's memory more often than that. And so the sign would always be on with a variety of messages. It's not a, there's a something happening with now we turn it on. It's more of a continuous thing. No, it would be, we'd be with, it would be with a variety of messages, but it wouldn't be continuous. Okay. Unless 
something was going on that it needed to be continuous. Thank you. Thank you. Better turn my microphone back on. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that. Um, I have one additional question, but it's not for you. It goes back to staff. I don't know if uh, Mr. Hansen's uh, online. And just to answer the question that Commissioner Cookton had asked uh, about the sight lines for the, the sign itself and if that's in the, in the uh, Clearview Triangle, I don't know if Mr. Hansen, if you can pipe in. Yeah, uh, Mr. Hansen, I will unmute you now. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, commissioners. Yeah, the uh, the, sign, the sign is proposed, I, and with the five foot setback, uh, would not be in conflict. I don't believe um, with the site, the Clearview Triangle at that corner. Um, however, uh, based on, on code and guidance, as, as Nick mentioned previously, um, you know, our recommendation would be to maintain that 15 foot offset from the right of way line there. But that's something we definitely would look at with the plans um, to verify that that would be outside of the uh, Clearview Triangle if it was uh, to stay in its current location. Okay, and just to clarify, um, if if the plans move forward and it was in the clear view, would that not be allowed? Correct. They would need to be relocated out of that area to keep that clear. Correct. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mr. Hanson. Thank you. All right. Um, at this point, at the we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. And so, if anybody would like to speak to this item from the public, I'd ask you to come forward and uh, give us your name and uh, speak to the item. Or if we have anybody on the line, I don't know uh, where we go first here. So, and the call in number again is 1415-655-0001. And then you can see the access code there as well, 2454-561-0217. And we have a speaker in the chambers here. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay, we are... Could I ask you to identify yourself, please? Ann Blett Matsky, 84th and Kell. Thank you. Our property butts right up to the back of the fire station. And we are original owners. We moved in in 61. And uh, it was an old farmhouse there. And we watched it being burned down. And now the fire station went up. And we have no qualms about having the fire station there. It's been just fine. We've gotten help now that my husband has medical issues and that. We've gotten help from the firemen. And um, the only problem is that we had for quite some time is that Alina parked their trucks on the east side and they ran them oh. all night. And that vibration comes right through the ground and it would come right into our bedroom there and you could just hear it the whole time your generator goes off periodically and we hear that too but it doesn't stay on forever um, and that's our biggest concern is that vibration through the ground and also that property <laughs> we refer to all that as a swamp because that's what it was <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I know you've had some work on uh, Irwin Road there because the road is sunk down, and so you've got something there to contend with too. And that signage, I I was wondering also what you were going to put on that sign. And you asked the question about that. So, um, and I also was wondering how close are you going to come to the lot line on the west side? somebody answer that or yeah, I can. go ahead mr johnson yeah the, the thank you for the oh, wow thank you for the question ma'am the the got our attention the enclosure on the if i can pull up the oh, let's get out of this mode here i can pull the site plan up again uh this and this is a good look at it this is the south side here this enclosure right here see on my okay, i'll use my see. mouse i'll go back to the site plan <laughs> this, this enclosure here on the southwest corner of the site, that's seven feet from the west property line. Wait a minute, southwest, here's 84, okay, right here. Yep. We're, we're right there. Okay, this enclosure is seven feet from the property line. The bulk of the structure is at a 20-foot setback. So it's set back 20 feet from the west line, 
that small en enclosure area that houses the generator and the trash and storage, that's yeah, seven that, feet. Is that going to vibrate through the ground here? Uh, I'm not an acoustical expert or a geo, uh, geological expert, but... Um, it does. You get that hum going all the time. Sure. Okay. I, one thing I will note is that I know you had a question about the, um, the EMS, and I believe that will be permanently housed inside, not outside. Mm -hmm. So right now it's just parked outside uh, all but the time. Not your generator. And what are you going to do with the, I call it the air raid siren, goes off once a month. We all have to get in the house right away. I, I asked this question once. Uh, I asked uh, Jay Forrester, Assistant Chief Forrester, told me that they will replace it uh, potentially on site, potentially maybe across the street, or but they have to keep it right in the area. Chief Seal. <laughs> okay. Way out of my lane. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of our severe weather sirens. We have 22 of them in the city, and they're plotted out so that we get as good a coverage in the city as we can. Um, and they are loud for people who live close, but I always get just as many calls from people who live farther away that complain they don't hear them. So it's kind of a fine balance. But we, we are planning to relocate it somewhere on that site as part of the, uh, as part of the project. All right, thank you, Chief. Appreciate that uh, feedback and that information. Our granddaughter was over a couple, well, the first of can, the month. Can, can you go to the microphone? Sorry. Oh, our, our granddaughter was over the first of the month, and she said, Grandma, today's the day the siren's going to go off at 1 o'clock, and we were going to cut grass back there. So she said, well, we better get going and get that grass cut. And, and so we were, and, and then we got in the house, and siren went off. She says, see, I had it all planned. That's good. <laughs> but the, the kids, I've taken care of them since they were little, and all the grandkids, and always had to bring them in the house and even into the basement. And my husband has ear hearing aids now, and it's very difficult <laughs> listening right. to that. But it's once a month, so that's... Okay. Uh, anything else you'd like for us uh, to know? No. I think I've spoke my piece. All right. Thank you very much, Anne. appreciate about it. that generator. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, commission members? Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, we do have one uh, caller on the line. Okay. We'll check in. Uh, Mr. Bolson, I will unmute you now. Hi, thank you. This is Kent Bolson. Uh, I live just north of the fire station on Johnson Circle. And uh, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the conversation that most of the questions I have have already been answered. Uh, but I have one thing I'd like to propose. I know that there's the likelihood that the minimum count for trees will not be met and that there's the ability to do a, uh, a essentially a buyout of that to locate trees elsewhere. If something like that is done, I would encourage consideration of planting those trees across the street at Wanda Miller Park to keep them in that same proximity um, rather than elsewhere in the city. Uh, but otherwise, I think my other questions have been addressed. All right, thank you, Mr. Bolson. I appreciate that information. Mr. Johnson, can you attest to that? Yeah, thank you, Chairman Solberg. Uh, there, thank you to the caller for bringing that issue. They may have uh, read through some of our staff notes on an earlier version of the plans that was short on the tree count. The more recent uh, updated landscape plan does have a code-complying amount of trees now, so they would not be held or required to do a fee in lieu of planting or plant trees elsewhere. But certainly more trees, the better, I always say. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Appreciate that. All right, any further uh, members in the audience who'd like to speak to this item? Come on up, sir. And if you can, again, identify yourself and uh, uh, speak into the microphone. We'll do uh, Brad Spam, 4317 West 84th Street. I'm directly west of the fire station. Um, I, I think it's going to be fine. i be honest with you, I have a farmstead in North Dakota. I have a pole barn up there, and it looks a lot better. <laughs> sitting there now <laughs> so i guess my only request would be that as we get a little closer with landscaping uh since i live right next door and will be affected by be a fence or whatever maybe some input or, or at least a con chance for conversation with the landscape architects on some options uh, on that buffer there and uh, maybe how it, i can tie it in nicely with some landscaping I have planned for the front of the house. So other than that, that's... Okay, thank you. And maybe you can give nice uh, Mr. Johnson your contact information. I've spoken to him, so that's okay. that's about it. Like I said, I'm, other, than, other than that, uh, I'm right next door, but it's uh, it'll be nice. It'll be fine. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your input tonight. 
Anybody else online, Mr. Markgard? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, nobody else on the phone. Okay. And anybody else in the audience that would like to speak to this issue? All right. Not seeing any. Commission members, I'd entertain a motion to close public hearing. Commissioner Albrecht? So moved. All right. Second. And a second. We have a motion and a second in front of us. Any further discussion? All right. Not seeing any. All those in favor of clo closing the public hearing at this time say aye. Aye. Commissioner aye. Thank you. That is unanimous, and I'll say I myself. I was going to go through it in person again like I'm used to online. So uh, <laughs> appreciate that. All right, commissioners, the uh, public hearing is now closed. Uh, we're open for discussion. Go ahead, Commissioner uh, Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I guess I realized maybe I should have asked this when we were in discussion, but I want to follow up, and perhaps uh, Mr. Hudson can share uh, the... Um, what are the testing requirements for the generator? How frequently can that expected to be tested uh, absent a situation where power has failed and it needs to run for a longer period of time? Go Thank ahead, you. Mr. Hudson. Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Roman, uh, the uh, generator is, is typically tested uh, once a month. That can be scheduled uh, on a clock, and that would certainly uh, be typical to be done during the middle of the day. Uh, to minimize the impacts of, of, uh, of that testing. And then the additional uh, usage is just literally when the power is off. Uh, extended usage, say, you know, say it's off for a while, it doesn't really uh, require additional testing uh, based on that. that it, and the, and the, the monthly testing runs for about? I'm, this will be a guess on my part, yeah, but no, I'm, just, I'm, my understanding is something in the range of like 15 minutes. Thank you. Sounds familiar it's, it's, with other it's practices. consistent with my understanding of that and my place of work as well. So hopefully that uh, provides some insight to uh, the members of the public who asked that question. Um, my observations on this, um, you know, I, I know that uh, this fire station is old. It's near my house and the coyotes are ready when every time they go out, the coyotes respond as well. So <laughs> perhaps, you know, bigger trucks, more, more coyotes. Um, I appreciate the comment about occupancy sensing lighting. Uh, I think aside from being the right sustainability thing, I, I, I do think, I know we need good quality lighting and the the trucks may go out at 3 a.m. and come back at 4 a.m. and have to do cleanup and that that's, you, you need good lighting then. But given how much time those uh, apparatus bays are unoccupied, I, I wanna be very clear about an expectation about um, the impact of light given how much glass we have on both the north and the south side. Um, as far as the sign thing question, I, you know, that's not a, I don't find the sign to be essential to the, the facility. You know, we're not, we're not uh, a furniture store competing with another furniture store. You know, people are not shopping for other fire stations. So, um, you know, the, the 15 foot setback, I'm comfortable with uh, the standard. Um, given that we don't have a sign now, we're not uh, taking away from what we had before. There are signs at Poplar Bridge to the west, Washburn to the east, and near as I can tell from my best eyeball, those are about uh, 15 foot setback and they're pretty easy to see. Uh, my only other comment, and it's not about the fire station specifically, but um, I, I know it, it meets the letter of our, of our code, but uh, I struggle with this as a, meeting the spirit of what I think a planned development is. And so again, this is within the bounds of that, but I just think that, you know, What's to stop the next project next door from coming in and wanting to maximize their their footprint and other things? And so, um, you know, in my mind, I, I see it more as a, a multi-unit kind of a thing. But again, that's that's not necessarily about this project. It's just about what kind of a uh, precedent we might be setting. Again, we need fire stations. We need good fire stations. Um, I know we're heading in the direction of a full-time professional fire force or some sort of a live in fire force and I support this project. Um, those are my primary concerns on this one. All right, thank you, Commissioner Roman. Anybody else at this point? I'll just uh, throw in a couple pieces on my own. Um, it generally, I can, I can support the project. Uh, again, maybe back to the sign uh, and that being an LED sign. I can see LED signs from seems like 300 feet away. Um, so I would, I would support uh, planning staff on this that that meet the setback requirement. Um, I certainly understand uh, the uh, fire chief's uh, desire to have messages on it, although it seems like they're relatively rare. So I think um, that's that's not out of the question to be able to have the sign in the proper location. As far as flagpole and and uh, screening, I I understand that's an issue, but it, 
Um, I'm I'm a little bit worried that you have a sign in the in the corner, uh, coming out of a, a residential area that could be distracting for drivers as well. So um, more so than maybe cars parked in the parking lot. So, um, but beyond that, as far as the uh, planned development, I think in my mind, um, you know, to Commissioner Roman's point, you know, is this a question of anything can come in, and really it comes back to the. Uh, the public benefit to me. And I think here with a fire station, I think by all uh, means necessary, what we're saying is we need a modern uh, facility. And in order to achieve that um, and the benefit that it provides, we have to provide some flexibility uh, in some cases. Uh, that doesn't mean we need to provide all flexibility. Um, I'm a, a I'll buy off on the on the, some of the setbacks. Although I could sit, I would wonder if you couldn't make, uh, for instance, the front setback. You know, won't two feet less and and be able to to still meet the needs of the fire station. Um, but that's uh, I'm not the architect of this, and um, I do believe that as it's designed, it does provide the benefit uh, to the community. So um, those are my comments. Uh, other commissioners, Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I can get comfortable with the plan development, uh, to your point, Mr. Chair, uh, because we get discretion. Uh, that, that gives me a comfort level that uh, the next guy can't just come in and do something similar if there's not a public benefit. And so um, being that we get a large amount of discretion on a plan development uh, flexibility, I, I can be comfortable with it. Um, in regards to the sign, I could be convinced of the five feet, but I think some good points have been made and I can support uh, keeping it at 15 feet. Um, to your point, uh, an LED sign in the evening is, is, is plenty visible, whether it's 10 feet or 15 feet. If all of our other signs are 15 feet, I've definitely noticed the other two signs on that street. And so I'm, I'm comfortable with the 15 feet as well. So, um, after those two points, I, I'm, I'm plenty supportive of this. I think it's a good project. Nice to see us uh, modernizing our fire stations, and I'm, I'm in support of this. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Cook. Yes, Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, too, am in support. I agree with the other commissioners regarding the 15-foot setback of the sign, um, particularly because of the orientation of the sign being very east west and focused on 84th i think you're going to be able to see it on 84th regardless if you are uh five feet or 15 feet set back there um other than that very supportive appreciative of uh the public for coming in and and um providing their um insight into um what their uh, experience is like with the current station and uh, the hopes and dreams for this uh, great new station that is before us. So I am I am in support. All right, thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. And I do have just one question uh, upon hearing each of the commissioners' uh, thoughts here. And Mr. Johnson, I just want to make sure uh, the current recommendation includes the 15-foot setback or does not? It does. It, it does. It uh, includes a condition that all signage on the site comply with the city code. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. I appreciate that. Uh, any further discussion from commission members? Commissioner Roman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One other item I forgot to mention, I didn't jot it down on my list here is, um, you know, certainly uh, the project will be designed to whatever standards and whatever fits, but given how much we are uh, in moving the station significantly to the west, I would encourage uh, the architects and the, and the staff to um, find out ways to be uh, creative and generous with what that uh, barrier is like to the west. We are coming a lot closer to that home. All right. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner Roman. And I would just add one more thing, just uh, based on the public uh, comment tonight and about uh, the noise and vibration is just as a good neighbor chief to uh, maybe do the rounds with the neighbors to find out what's the best time, not just assume everybody uh, is away from work or awake uh, in the middle of the day. So thank you. All right, commission members, uh, I would entertain a motion hearing uh, after the discussion we've already had. Commissioner Cookton. Mr. Chair, in case PL2021-186, I move to recommend approval of an ordinance rezoning 4201 West 84th Street from R1 to R1PD. All right, commission members, we have a motion in front of us. Is there a second? Second. 
Commissioner Albrecht with a second. Commission members, we have a motion and a second in front of us to recommend approval of an ordinance rezoning 4201 West 84th Street from R1 to R1PD. Are there any further discussions? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, motion passes. Moving on. Is there a, another motion? Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In case number PL2021-186, having been able to make the required findings, I move to recommend approval of preliminary and final development plans for a new approximately 25,000 square foot fire station, replacing existing fire station number four, located at 4201 West 84th Street, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Thank you, Commissioner Albrecht. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Roman with a second. All right, Commission members, we have a motion and second in front of us to make the uh, to move to recommend approval of the preliminary and final development plans for a new approximately 25,000 square foot fire station replacing existing station number four located at 4201 West 84th Street subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes, and this item will now move forward to the October 25th City Council meeting as a public hearing. Thank you, everybody. Moving on to item number two, which is considering approval of the draft um, July 22nd and August 5th Planning Commission meeting synopsis. And I know for a fact I was not here for either of those, so I will abstain um, from the voting. But uh, commission members uh, who might get to it quicker than me may know who was present. I think you were the only one. All right. Um, I'll move to it. There we go. All right. For the uh, July 22nd, 2021 Planning Commission synopsis, uh, all commission members present tonight were in attendance. I was the only one absent. So, uh, commission members, is there a motion uh, to approve the Planning Commission synopsis? Question, question Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Commissioner uh, Crookton. If you are not voting, we don't have a quorum. Does that? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe the rules state that you need a majority of the members who are present at that meeting. So were there, no. were there six present? Yes. Six. So we don't have a majority. So we'll need to All right, delay we'll need to continue that. Continue it. All right, Commission members, we need a motion to continue this item. So moved. All right, Commission members, there's a motion to continue the July 22nd Planning Com Commission synopsis. Is there a, a second. second? Yes, all right. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. I would, if I can, I will amend, uh, given the attendance, I will move to amend that to continue both the July 22nd and the October 5th uh, Planning Commission synopsis. Uh, August 5th, is that? Yes, both, all right. both of the subject topics. All right, And I'll you. second both. All right, Planning Commission members, we have a motion and second in front of us to continue both the July 22nd and August 5th Planning Commission synopsis. Any further discussion on that? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, Planning Commission synopsis have been continued to our next Planning Commission meeting. All right, third item, election of Planning Commission officers and Commission members. And uh, what we have informally discussed in the past is that we would like all Planning Commission members to be available uh, for voting on that. So I would entertain a motion. Um, what was the language you used, Mr. Mark? We did continue it indefinitely. You did? Yeah. All right, shall we continue it again? Yeah, Mr. Chair, since we put it on the agenda, uh, we'll need to continue it indefinitely. Or I move to continue the consider of a, oh no of the the election of planning commission officers all right. indefinitely. All right, thank you. Is there a second? Second. All right, uh, planning commission members, we have a motion to continue indefinitely the election of the planning commission officers. Is there any further discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, moving on to our fourth item tonight, planning commission policy and issues update. Mr. Markegard, would you please give us an update on that? Sure. Or an introduction. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioners, this is a new item that we'll have on all of your uh, future agendas, and it will be a chance for staff to make any announcements and then for the commissioners to make any announcements or identify any issues, uh, things of that nature. So by way of announcements, uh, Wednesday evening, next week, September 29th at 6 p.m., 
Uh, we have a ULI panel discussion, uh, navigating your competitive future. Planning commissioners are all invited. I believe I've heard from the four present that uh, you plan to attend. Uh, <clears throat> just today we learned that the uh, meeting will shift to fully virtual. So um, you'll be getting a revised uh, WebEx link for that meeting. Um, so it will be fully virtual. And then looking forward to future planning commission meetings. Next meeting is October 7th. And we have uh, one item, one development item on the agenda. Public hearing on the redevelopment at Southtown Center at the High V site. And so just one item on October 7th. And then on October 14th, uh, we have three development items presently. Um, one of which is a redevelopment at Clover Center, uh, 98th and Lindale. Second item is a privately initiated code amendment to establish a new use, uh, high density motor vehicle sales. And then to make that a conditional use in the C1, C2, and C3 zoning districts. And then finally, <clears throat> a change of condition uh, for the Nine Mile Brewing Company at 9555 James Avenue South. So those are the only announcements I have. All right, thank you. And then uh, as uh, you mentioned, this is really an opportunity for commission members to bring up items um, uh, just to, for general discussion, um, information from staff. So I wanna make yeah. sure we're clear with our legal staff on what we can and can't talk about, so. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, so we wouldn't be able to talk about any development items right. or items coming before the commission in the future. But if there are things that you want to flag in terms of procedures or things that you want the city to look into, uh, that type of thing, or announcements. Okay. All right. And commission members, and, uh, anything specific to this month um, that you'd like to bring up? If not, I'll mention one item. And that's, that's really, uh, I would like staff, since we just recently introduced the transportation portion to our agendas um, I, I'm wondering if staff can have the discussion and, and uh, bring back to us thoughts about how the Planning Commission can provide input into uh, maybe in coordination with the Sustainability Commission um, some of the uh, maybe larger improvements um, or public works improvements uh, throughout the city for instance um, reconstruction and how, how that may uh, meet our goals for the city and or sustainability goals. Um, so if, if that's something uh, staff can look into and provide some information back to us, I recognize that's a long planning process uh, for public works, but I think it's important um, for uh, our input as well. So. Others, uh, anything else? I'll give one more one more chance. So I would I would support that as well, uh, including if, if we want to look at perhaps standards, sure. in, in the in the, our, our work plan for okay. the coming year. All right, all right, all right. Um, one last chance. Otherwise, uh, at this point, uh, that concludes our September twenty third, twenty twenty one planning commission meeting. Thank you all.